Hey everybody, I'm Karen Bryant. Welcome to What Had Happened Was. What Had Happened Was. I, wait a minute, I messed up. I was supposed to say, hi, I'm Karen Bryant. Oh yeah, and I'm Angela Hill, uh, Overkill Hill. And this is. What? What Had Happened Was. <laughs> we should do it like really stupid, like what had. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hey, so uh, episode 11 of the podcast, what had happened was um, this week, we didn't have any UFC fights. There was some Bellator and there was some other stuff going on, but we thought maybe today we would do some Q&A, right? Yeah, I think that, uh, that's the best way to use our time because we always have these amazing questions, but there's so much to get through with the fights that we never get a chance to address them. So we're giving back to our fans, our many, many fans out there. We're going to give them a little spotlight, answer yes. some questions, and uh, yeah, do the damn thing. Awesome. We'll do the damn thing, and we have some other topics, too, to talk about. Maybe we'll talk about the tough coaches and stuff like that, although I will say it is Easter, um, so hopefully everybody has had a happy Easter, and if people didn't see the post you put out of your incredible, iconic <laughs> drawing of John, DC, and Joe as eggs, they need to look at your post. Yes, go look at my Instagram right now. We, I just posted. I was actually late to recording because I had to post this egg thing before Easter was over. But um, yeah, me and uh, me and uh, my husband Adam, we met in art school. I don't know if I told you guys this, but I went to art school, and we met there. And so every now and then we like to do like little projects together. And um, last year we did Tito versus um, Chuck Liddell as eggs. <laughs> because quarantine just hit and we were really bored. So this yeah. year we were like, hey, let's do it again. So this time uh, we did uh, the iconic um, DC, Anik, and um, and um, Joe Rogan right. freaking out after uh, <laughs> after your boy uh, Darush knocked out uh, close. So that was pretty fun. It was it's fun. a great drawing, I and I love that you <laughs> also used the earthier egg for DC. The brown egg, I thought was like, you actually, you guys did, it, it's, it's amazing. It looks really we got, good. We got the organic egg for, for DC. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Karen. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's very cool. Well, um, the Easter Bunny didn't come today, but um, luckily Amazon brought me the other day my Easter basket, which is basically um, a bunch of, and I was actually going to share a picture of it too. I still need to do it of the zebra popcorn from Popcornopolis or whatever. You know that that stuff is like, it's like crack cocaine for people who know um, the yes. zebra popcorn. And so I had treated myself yes. to a bunch of it the other day. It was so on what sale. Was it, like uh, dark chocolate and it's popcorn and, and then salt? it's dribbled, drizzled with chocolate and yes, um, I love that stuff. caramel or something maybe or white. I don't know. It's, ridiculous it's the zebra so one good. so people who know i will probably i was like oh i need to share a picture of me and my zebra popcorn because that's my uh <laughs> a cheat in the self um yeah and, you know, get some stuff for the kid head. but you know what yeah what the zebra popcorn right. would have matched your uh elephants in the background too. yeah exactly so remember exactly. that for next time yeah exactly <laughs> um all right well so and you know i don't know um what kind of questions you got i got some i mean a lot of time um uh, somebody was asking me, they were like, ask, ask it. there was like an old question that they were asking about like John Jones in DC or like something that oh. had happened behind, b b backstage back in the day. Oh. But I was like, no, 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 oh. let's just get to some more recent let's questions. <laughs> <laughs> I like the back in the day questions though, because you have like that behind the scenes view, right? That like people aren't really, people don't really get to see that often. I do. And I will say that, you know, like that one that was really incredible that time when when John and DC were on in separate rooms talking crap, but you know, they're really not that I far away from each other. One. Like some yeah. of that stuff is really dicey. I mean, I know, I remember, you know, I was at the desk when, let's say when Tony had that exchange um, with Kevin Lee, remember on, on, on oh, post show yeah. and yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. sitting there and they were going back and forth and Kevin was really you know, giving Tony a hard time on the show. And mm -hmm. the funny thing is, is a little bit later on, Kevin came and did the desk with us and he, 
realize after he was like, oh, this is really hard. I maybe gave Tony a little bit too much grief. And I was oh. like, yeah, you might have. You might have. Like, I love Tony anyway, and I love Kevin too, yeah. but I was like, I'm a big Tony fan. And yeah. so after Kevin came to the desk and he realized how hard it was and how challenging it was, he was like, yeah, maybe, maybe I should have, like, given Tony a break <laughs> on that. I was like, yeah, maybe a little bit. But there have been some hilarious moments, like when John Jones and Anthony together at the desk, and like anytime we used to get some of those things going, it was incredible. I mean, I was there, obviously working the one with Colby and Kamaru. There's Mm. been some crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I I think those moments are are so I don't know tense. You know, it's almost as tense as the fight in itself because you're just sitting there and you're wondering like. Is something about to pop off? Am I going to have to, like, <laughs> you know, bop, hop in between? Like, um, oh, what's his name? He had to, like, break up the <laughs> John Jones. Yeah. And, uh, well, and, remember, uh, well, back in the day when Holla Schaller had to break up DC and John. And yes, that's when John yes. threw the shoe, or DC yeah. threw the shoe. He hit my friend Anahisa from Globo, um, <laughs> which is crazy. He hit her in the head with the shoe. But yeah, but th- that's that's totally iconic of Dave Schaller, like trying to hold back DC yes, and Dave John. Dave Schaller, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. He, he was OG too. Like, I love that. I actually have a photo of him holding me in some random, I think it was Chuck Liddell. <laughs> him holding me in like Chuck Liddell or somebody back. And um, as if we were about to fight because we totally right. would fight each other in real life. But no. yeah, it, he's he's awesome. Yeah. He's, but, so um, okay, so then let me ask you a question. Then what's the most uh, what's the most tense face off you've ever had? Man, my face offs aren't that tense. I think uh, I don't know. I feel like I don't take it that seriously. Like the face off, just because the fight is the thing that I'm looking forward to. The yeah. face off, I'm more so like looking at them you know i'm looking at the shoulders looking at their like height i'm looking at like uh you know if their fists are shaking or not you know like i'm i'm looking for little little tidbits that can give me more confidence when i go in there because like you try to pull something from anything if you see their story and they're like oh i think angela is a strong opponent i'm like yes yeah, she thinks i'm strong i'm a fucker up you know <laughs> like you try to get whatever you can and use that as fuel for the fight so I'm trying to think. I guess I guess my most tense one might be uh, uh, Olivia Souza oh. uh, in Invicta. Yeah. I was challenging for the title, and she felt disrespected by me because um, I did an interview after my second Invicta fight, and I knocked the girl out. And they were like, oh, would you fight for the title? I'm like, uh, sure, I guess. <laughs> like, I, My main concern was winning fights so I could get back into the UFC. And I didn't realize how much the Invicta belt would have meant to me at the time. Like when I won it, I was like stoked. I, I felt like I accomplished something great. But you did. at the time, I'm just like, yeah, yeah. But before I won it, I was just like, eh, I, I don't mind beating up more girls who aren't as good as Livia, you know? <laughs> So, um, so, so yeah, she felt disrespected yeah. and she was like, oh, if you, uh, you can fight for the title when I let you fight for the title. So my next fight, I fought for the title <laughs> moving forward. And I guess she still hated me for some reason. And when we faced off, um, she gave me the finger and I was like, <laughs> what, where's this animosity coming from? But when she gave me the finger, I was like, oh, oh yeah, is that right? You want to fuck me? Is that what it is? Like, <laughs> I was feeling myself. But um, I, I, I feel like that was, like, the most tense face-off. And, of course, like, after beating her, people, like, dragged her. And now she's been more respectful in her yeah. face-offs and everything. Because it is hard talking shit and then losing and then getting dragged by the media. Or not the media, but dragged by the fans. Yeah. Like, it's a tough one. So that's why a lot of people don't do it. And that's why a lot of uh, the the come up to, like, uh, fights are boring because people don't want to get dragged <laughs> if they lose. It's um, true. I suppose it is a delicate balance of – because, yeah, you want to hype it and you want to sell it and you are confident. I always tell people, I think I would talk a lot of crap if yeah. if I could. Like – I would, 
in general, I think I'm pretty sassy and I kind of probably am just talking a lot of crap without the mics rolling because I'm not stupid either. Yeah. But um, but I do think that in competition, like I, you know, I'm on a tennis team, which is funny, but I would talk crap if they would let me. I would, I, I joke at practice and I'm talking crap all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and I played a lot of sports as, as in, in, when I was younger and everything. So I was hyper competitive and all that. So I'm, I'm very, very competitive. And I do think I would probably talk a little crap, but it wouldn't necessarily always be be mean or whatever but I think I would be a little bit more savvy on the mic like I feel like I could yeah. bust him up at a press conference and get more jokes in on this you know on the fly that kind of stuff I feel like I'd be better right. at I maybe wouldn't necessarily yeah plot out a bunch of crap talk though I don't know. would you do like the rhyming verses like you know I would say hey. oh hey girl hey I'm a beat your ass because you ain't got no class Meet me on Saturday. I'm going to beat you, you know, until uh, I'm, uh, mad. I'm, I'm not mad that day. I don't know. I would make something up. Yes. Here's the thing. You made I it used to, made Oh, it no. Work. I could say. My joke is, though, Angie, even like I know people like to make fun of Tyron and his rapping, but Tyron's my friend. And I always told him. Dude, I will write you the rhymes, but I don't necessarily know if I have the flow because I'm a broadcaster, right? And I went to school Uh for, I didn't go to school for broadcasting, but I've always thought highly of, you know, uh, delivery and all that and worked in radio and all this. So I don't, I can't, I don't say the N word ever. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, like there's a lot of stuff I can't do. And so as a rapper, I'm like, my rap name would have to be like Miss Grammar or something because I wouldn't, I can't like... It, it, it kind of irks me to say things incorrectly and stuff like that. But I was like, hey, uh, Tyron, I'll write you rhymes and then you can like street them up for me because they're going to also be super freaking bougie. Um, <laughs> but I can flow. I can I can rhyme pretty quickly, I think. Yes. That's like working the gloves. Like, hey, here are these pristine MMA gloves. Now you can like break them in, get them like all nice and used looking. So uh, so no one will notice that they're fresh off the press from Karen Bryant. Right. You know? <laughs> well, here's the thing, Angie. So my brother, for people who know, if you're on, if you're watching this on Instagram, if you follow Six String Guy, that's my brother, and he is a guitar player. And I did talk to him, Angie, about writing us uh, something for our theme song. So he Yay. told me he would give us some beats or whatever, because he's like, "Well, what kind of stuff do you want?" He's more of a rock and roll guy. I was like, "Well, I'm gonna need something we can rap over." <laughs> and so, at some point, we will have a theme beat or something, and I will, I will write us a what happened was podcast. You know, it'll be, it'll be something. But you might have to deliver it. I don't, I, man. Don't look at me to rap. I'm the worst. <laughs> like I, I'm like you. I can think of the rhymes in in a bit of time. It, it might not take me too long. Right. But when it comes to the delivery, like I sound like the old school. Like, hey, I was going down the store and I met this whore. You know, like <laughs> like it's like a, a just an account of your day. It doesn't really right. sound like you're like being aggressive or anything. Right. So I don't know. I, I feel like that's just my style. Like I'm just like. Hey, everything's chill. Everyone likes each other. This is yeah. cool. Let's just enjoy the things that are great in life. Like, That's what I'm saying. You and I could. And yeah, we'll be like a, we'll be like a like a um <laughs> like a tribe called Quest vibe. That's what I'm. Yeah, thinking. yeah, exactly. Yes, but yes, this but we cool. also would have some old school like Roxanne, Roxanne up in there. I want to be your man, like because that's just <laughs> Roxanne, yeah, well, Roxanne. Gotta, gotta, um, I want to be your man. All right, I'm looking on Twitter to see if we have any questions for you here. But you said you got a lot on your post on IG, right? I got a few. I got a few decent ones. We got some bad ones too that we're not going to. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> They're all great questions. Good. Keep me asking. Um, but I have one for okay. you, and I think this is a really nice question from Red Ed underscore twelve. Thank okay. you for the question. I really think you two should talk about your individual past in this sport. One as an athlete and the other as a reporter. Um, KB, to me, is as much a pioneer in the coverage of MMA as Ariel Helwani. Oh, oh. I wish you guys had more time to expand on the subject on your last podcast. Then, of course, there is your... There is you, uh, me, <laughs> a trained artist who now paints massacres on opponents faces how did you make that leap so that's a pretty cool question but i want to start with you kb tell me your story your journey your path to the 
to the limelight of the UFC and all the cool little things that happened in between. This is so bad because I was going to start with you. Um, no, no, it's your turn. Okay, I'll try to make it quick, but like for those people who don't know, um, you know, I I started out, uh, my, my first TV gig was MTV. Uh, I used to work in radio and everything, and so then I started to get into, I was either going to go into the record business or uh, like, you know, TV type stuff. And so the job at MTV kind of melded both of those things. But literally, I was probably going to do A&R and go out and try to help sign bands. I ran a radio station and I love it. And that's really, I love music. So I was truly deciding between trying to get a job in a record company. And I got an audition at MTV and I got a job at MTV. And from there, you know, or else this is for and I let them watch your TV. So, but so getting into, getting into, cut to, 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 covering mixed martial arts though um i was working on an entertainment show at cnn and then i got the job at uh showtime championship boxing they needed somebody to do the backstage reporting so i started working for them and i worked for them for three and a half years and i did the vasquez marquez fights and they were incredible and i was the last one to interview diego corrales in the in the ring and he was incredible and so i covered a lot of boxing from wow. there we got into mma with the saturday hey. night fights oh, hey cheers Happy Easter, um. <laughs> <laughs> and um so all those Saturday night fights, like the one with Kimbo when he got knocked out by Seth Petrozelli, I'm sitting there right by the cage. If you see those, you're like, you see my face like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, the- so, uh, yeah, what? <laughs> and so started cover, you know, getting into MMA coverage then. Um, at the same time in 2007, we started MMA Heat. So we had like our own thing on the side to be able to do, you know, because that was kind of still the wild, wild west and you could get access to top people and you could, you could have a lot more um, a, a availability with the fighters when you'd go to the shows. So a lot of that's changed. We don't really do that as much anymore because we're just a little company and a lot of those are like the big conglomerates now. But the start in covering um, uh, combat sports was with Showtime Boxing and then with the CBS stuff and then starting our own thing. And then I started working with UFC in 2012. So the first show that I did with them was uh, the show in Sweden, that first show in Sweden, I was doing the reporting, but I've always been an anchor in my other jobs. And so then I started anchoring with them and, uh, really, so it's been since 2012 with the UFC. I want to hopefully get into the contributor wing of the hall of fame one day for that. Like I do yes, love this so much and it's a should. weird thing to have found that I didn't set up, you know, I mean, MMA didn't really exist that way, right? You don't set out to say, I'm going to go be an, an MMA reporter or an anchor. Like at the time it didn't really exist. So now that I found it, I love it. And I, I would love to do this for the rest of the time. So I totally love yeah. it. I started to learn Portuguese after I did this because I wanted to be able to communicate with more fighters. I totally love what I do. I feel very honored to be in the position I am to, um, be at the desk and talk about the greatest sport for the number one organization with Hall of Famers and incredible people at my side. I feel very, very truly blessed and honored to do that. And uh, I hope I get to do it forever because I just absolutely love it. Yay! I hope you do too. And you are one of the first faces, not that I saw, but that I noticed because yeah. I was like, hey, sis! you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. When i started getting into mma yeah. like i was i was a little nervous because i was like this is kind of a white boy sport you know <laughs> yeah, like you don't see like black people playing hockey doing nascar and you didn't really see black women uh doing uh mma so to see you um like uh, out there on the desk talking to people, interviewing like big names, huge names. Like it was really cool to see. And I'm like, okay, if uh, if uh, this woman Karen Bryant is out there like making a career out of it, then maybe I can too. So that did give me a little more courage seeing you on that platform. And uh, when I was still like kind of on the fence, I was doing Muay Thai at the time. I would watch MMA, but I was terrified of it. I was like, I do not want to get my head bounced well you're cute too yeah (laughs) but I didn't I didn't care about my face but I did care about my brain because I I do feel like I'm kind of smart like (laughs) like I felt like I was smarter before I started getting punched in the face but like you know like that the bouncing of the head off of the canvas it's so much different than uh getting punched in the face standing. So that that scared the hell out of me. Like I I, I did one sparring uh, round with like uh, grappling and punches and I was like, eh, I don't know. 
But the better I got, the more I got into it. And obviously, going back to my original point, seeing your face up there doing it, that was that was really cool to see as well. Because you didn't see many black women in that in that like sphere of MMA in general. So that was really cool. And um, I guess to go to my story, I started training Muay Thai in 2009 I think yeah so that was like the first time I threw a punch just for fun punch. like just like because you were just for fun yeah so so the story is I met my husband and uh in college and then after college he moved to New York and we started living together we got married and Pretty much we were just sitting on our asses, just playing video games, eating pizza, and just being happy, you know, just being yeah. happy and married. And, like, when you're happy and married, you get fat. So, <laughs> Don't so we were both getting fat, and I was like, you know what? I think I need to move around a bit. And I always wanted to fight or learn how to fight yeah. since I was a kid. I didn't, I didn't want to fight professionally, but I always wanted to just have it in my back pocket because I was, like, a skinny little thing, a lot like you skinny little thing i was uh, never skinny that's hilarious <laughs> i love you i'll pay yeah. you later you see your shoulder we see your collarbone right now you i am skin thin now and i'm not a dude people love to point out my big adam's apple i have a thyroid condition that i get it checked quite bad. often i am not a dude anyway <laughs> no dude they're just jealous of your natural athleticism but I was about like 110 pounds soaking wet. Like I, I had no muscle or whatever. So I wanted to learn how to defend myself because I was living in New York City at the time. And I just felt like it would just boost my confidence. It would right. keep me from feeling fat. I was like skinny fat. Like I had like an E.T. belly. <laughs> skinny skinny I love that phrase so much. <laughs> <laughs> I look like the uh the oh somebody my uh, friend told me the name of them the other day the coffee the coffee aliens and men in black like <laughs> oh right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I look like that skinny arms skinny legs and like a little ET belly so I wanted to get rid of that I wanted like the lines and me and my husband started training together we fell in love with it we started training at a gym with a coach that was really fun brandon levi evolution muay thai if you're in new york go check it out because he's he's amazing and you'll get in shape there and um my career just took off from there like every time i after nine months of training i had my first fight i didn't really think i was ready but my coach was like hey you're you're ready like might as well jump in there. What's the worst that could happen? I was like, oh, you're right. What is the worst that could happen? Well, my face up, can get yeah. broken. My face can get fucked up, but who needs who needs faces? I'm an animator. So, uh, <laughs> so after my first fight, I won, and then I had more fights. I kept beating girls who were more experienced than me, and I realized I had uh, I had like a talent for it. So I ended up winning um, all 14 of my amateur Muay Thai fights. I went pro. I had two uh, pro Muay Thai fights. I ended up winning those two. Um, I, right around that time, they announced that they were bringing in straw weight weight class, that Ronda Rousey was already there kicking ass in the That's UFC. right. And then they were like, hey, we're going to do a season of tough and we're going to bring in straw weights. And that was around like 2014, I think. Yeah. So um, I scrambled to get my first MMA fight. So I qualify. Oh, to right. Be yeah, right, right. And I had my first MMA fight two days before the tough tryouts. I knocked the girl out. I flew to Vegas. I tried out for the show. I got on the show, and the rest is history. So now I am a strawweight in the UFC. I had like a lot of ups and downs. I was on the show. I I uh, won my first fight in the UFC. Lost my second to got cut, but then mm -hmm. won four in a row. Got brought back into the UFC, and like just a lot of ups and downs. But I've always been consistently getting better and consistently beating better competition. So, uh, yeah, that's my story. Well, and the thing that that's interesting for people who don't, who maybe weren't there at the beginning, cause I was there and I saw you, you know, we, we, we were talking about this uh, offline the other day about tough talk and all that, but I was there from the beginning and you were thrown to the wolves. I mean, that's the thing. And yeah. now for people to know the backstory and that you didn't really have a ton of experience before you got there. And that's the thing is we've heard of people 
in the UFC and then they get cut and then they they try to fight their way back and some people never make it and some people do. And I think you, you're a great example of it. Brandon Moreno is another example of this, right? Guys that were not that experienced who were on the show, had some success there. And same thing, thrown to the wolves, get cut, come back. We look at this man now. He's challenging for a title. That's going to be in your future as well. I just think that that's an interesting context for people to know um, that your growth, a lot of your growth happened in the UFC. And there's a lot of people like that, uh, that have maybe, I know some people who have come from the scene in Europe, uh, in England, that kind of thing, where they're maybe a bigger person. They didn't have a lot of competition before they got there. So they got to the UFC and had to kind of learn on the job, which can be sort of tough. So I understand that sometimes maybe the grief you got really wasn't fair. It was because you were learning on the job there and then had to, had to just prove it on the job, which is hard because, you're under the lights and you're out there and doing it and like it's that's a big ask to learn on the job with this kind of job scary shit yeah (laughs) especially when there's like violence involved you know Mm -hmm. um but even even when I do the broadcasting stuff I I get so nervous I get the same stress sweats that I get when I'm getting ready to walk out into the arena um so uh yeah it's all just like it's all just you putting yourself out there is such a scary thing but when you do it well it's so satisfying I'm sure you feel that too like every now and then you'll just be like I killed it, KB, you know? Yeah, it's funny, though, you say that because I'm hypercritical, and I very rarely will say that I did something well uh, on the air, and I really, I'm very, uh, yeah, not great to myself in terms of what I say. Um, I'm vicious about my looks, like all of it. All, a lot of the natural things that women do to themselves, it's crappy. I do it, and tenfold often which is bad but there are times when I have had some things over the course of my career and I look back I'm like all right you nailed that one <laughs> I was like you kind of you yeah you. you did all right yeah, you know what I mean yeah. so yeah yeah you know so there and I have my moments but like I said I hope I hope that one day both of us can be in the hall of fame I think that would be really 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 cool it's going to happen. We're going to will it. We're going to will you it know, right now. Episode gonna, 11. We willed it. We're going to will it. We're going to will it. All right. Well, I love that somebody asked that because it is interesting yeah, to hear the question. story. And I guess that's that's also just something really great for young women to know that um, that you sometimes, you know, I know um, my girl Heidi Andral has been sharing a lot on her Instagram lately, too, about um, about, you know, a lot of time women in general, but a lot of just people in general. Mm-hmm. feel like they have to have everything plotted out before they start something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you just start. And I did really like that she shared something about that the other day. And that was a really good point that a lot of time we think we have to have everything perfect. You and I started this podcast with like an idea of like, hey, you want to do it? And yeah, we don't still have all our graphics and we don't have everything here. We do great demos and we're going <laughs> to get our things done. But hey, we're already yeah, 11 episodes <laughs> in and hey. we just started to do the damn thing. And so I, I yeah. do I do kind of think that um, that maybe that's a lesson people should should take is just go for it sometimes. And if you learn on the job, and, and unfortunately, MMA fans can be awful. Um, our our can. fans can be awful, but. They can, but they're not writing your paychecks. And that's the best part. Like my, Dana, uh, Mick Maynard, like those are the guys that I have to impress. And luckily I have been impressing them. Yep. Every time I show up, I show up, I scrap and win or lose, they're happy with my performance. Right. So that's all that really matters. And, um, and I think a lot of people get so obsessed with like being undefeated, mm-hmm. never misstepping. So that one time they misstep, it destroys them. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard to see. And I hate when I see it. I, I was uh, feeling horrible for uh, Adesanya when, when he like lost to Blockowitz, but mm-hmm. you know, like he probably wasn't feeling that just because he was still champion. He still, he moved up. He gave himself a a disadvantage in order to challenge himself more. You know what I mean? So it kind of protects you. It shields you from that disappointment a little bit. But um, you see it a lot when fighters come up, like you said, from from like not having tough, tough competition or just never losing yet. 
And then they face that tough guy. They lose. They could be in a hard way. It could be like a, a split decision loss or something, a bullshit shit decision. But it always hurts. And you're always just like, now what? You know, like, what did I do wrong? I did everything right. I trained hard. I never, like, I never slacked. I never, like, you, you know, skipped the practice. But I still lost. Like, what does that mean? Am I not good enough? Am I not this or that? But really, it's just like, if you still, if you're still passionate, if you still believe in, what you're doing if you still love what you're doing then just keep doing it you know like just keep doing it and all the pieces will fall into place eventually so that's been my mantra like mm -hmm. if I lose a fight I'm in the gym the next day fixing whatever I messed up on but yeah. also enjoying the process and sometimes that's hard after you lose you know sometimes that's hard when you slip up when you when you fuck up an interview when you mm -hmm. mess up a presentation you don't get that promotion it's hard to just keep chugging along and doing your thing but the people who quit are the people that you're beating just by staying consistent and working on things and improving yourself so if you let that misstep uh discourage you then you end up falling behind everyone else who's determined enough to keep moving forward so i always say that um uh well i don't always say it but a lot of times <laughs> you have to remind yourself let's be yeah. honest <laughs> a lot of times uh i think like you know it, it if after like a loss or something i'm like you know what this sucks but the fact that I'm still working on myself and the fact that I'm still moving forward and getting better, I might just outlast all these girls who are beating me, you know? Like yeah. you can you can outlast them. Just keep moving, keep keep working. And if it's worth it to you, like getting to that point is gonna feel so good. So that that's my motto. Just keep going keep working. Don't feel like, you know, oh, I failed. Better go kill myself. Better go do something right. else. No, no. Just keep going. Keep doing your thing. In the end, no one's going to remember any of it. We're all going to be dead. So don't worry about the fans. Don't worry about, like, you know, what the big the big outcome is. Just worry about being happy, being in the moment, and enjoying your life. That's all That's all that really matters. It is all that matters. It's a lot easier said than done, though, because we all get caught up in some of the <laughs> drama sometimes and bellyache <laughs> over some stupid tweet we read or some comment somebody yeah. wrote. And yeah. you're like, and the thing that when that happens is infuriating to me is, no, I'm not really necessarily mad about the comment, because sometimes the other comment, you're like, whatever, that's just stupid, but like, the times when it does bother you, then I'm I'm more mad that I'm bothered by it. Like I'm mad at myself yes. for being bothered by something mm -hmm. insignificant. And then I have to remind myself, that, like, yeah, like happy people and, and, and people who have their life sorted and who are looking for positive things don't take time out of their day to go on social media and crap on other people. Like mm -hmm. you just don't like, so those yeah. people that are doing it are actually pretty sad and desperate. And then, it, you know, when you can remember to put that stuff in perspective, but it's hard some days because some days you're it's like, oh, this sucks. It really hates me. Dude, I would love to take my block list and just like visit them individually and just punch them in the face. Just like kick them in the nuts real quick. Because I know they're all dudes. They're all dudes. <laughs> they're all fucking sad guys who haven't gotten laid. I would love to just show up and be like, hey, did you say that? Uh, yeah, I hey, Scooter fan number 1712. <laughs> yeah, guess what? <laughs> Time's up. Right, yeah. Well, punt right to the nuts. I hope they. Uh, go back up into your body and and rot. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, so <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm above any of that, right. but in the end, I like I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> but I will also say, got my little drink. Yeah, and, well, you were saying some important stuff though about like yeah. also sticking with it and not and not just you know a lot of people. I hate to say kids these days. But a lot of people who ask me about my YouTube thing, they're like, hey, how long did it take you to get whatever? Because, hey, if you go over to YouTube forward slash Karen Bryant, that's K-A-R-Y-N, B-R-Y-A-N-T, you know, got a lot of subscribers over there and there's like 1,600 yeah. videos and there's, you yeah, know, a lot, a lot of stuff. And people are like, yeah, how long did it take you to build it? I'm like, well, we started it in 2007. They're like, holy crap. Like, oh, I yeah. want, you know, and people want something that they started last week. That's going to, you know, have 3,000, you know, whatever. So you buy your yeah. bots or whatever. Don't do that. I'm just saying. So that is one thing that I will say that um, it's been a long road and you had to just build it slowly. And anything, as you know, Angela, your skill set, anything that's going to be of merit 
is going to probably take some time. Yeah. And you have to keep with it. And it's funny that you said that thing about outlasting because I can't tell you. I literally can't keep score of how many people came and went in the time since I started to now who thought they were going to get into it and who left and who couldn't hang or, you know, there's been a lot of cute girls that were like, I'm super cute and I'm going to do some interviews <laughs> and then hey. they're gone like after three because guess what? <laughs> yeah, you're cute. But if there's no substance there, it's not, it's not going to last. So, uh, yeah. so yes, I, 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 I have seen a lot of people come and go uh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, just keep working on your thing. Sure. Keep working on yourself, working on your stuff. It's so hard. Like the other day, I accidentally like a uh, like I'll I'll like accidentally swipe over to my suggested like Instagram stuff, and that's like a no no. Yeah, I can never do it. Don't because I always see some bitch I hate in the strawweight division fucking acting happy. I'm like, <laughs> it's so easy to hate, you know. And and I honestly feel like hating on other people is is a really uh it's just really bad for your soul you it know is. yeah you can talk shit or whatever i talk a lot of shit but in the end like i don't give a fuck about what they have or what this other person have i just want to be happy with what i have you know happy with being comfortable being happy with my family and my dog and <laughs> you know you like are. the fact that i learned a new submission today hey maybe yeah. i'll do it in a fight one day who knows yeah. who knows hey i have a question when are you, you fighting again <laughs> well <laughs> i'm enjoying uh my last drinks for a while um because fight camp starts on monday so News coming up. I can't say who or when, but soon you guys will know why this is my last drink. Nice. So cheers, Karen. Cheers. 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 Yes, cheers. you kind of heard it here first. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and I may or may not be working that day. Yeah. It's a good omen. I Money. always when you work. <laughs> Money. Hey, I have a question for you. What's your take on, it was announced the other day, Volkanovski and um, Brian Ortega will be coaching the Ultimate Fighter since you're a veteran of the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. I am curious what your take is on that. I think that's going to be really cute. I think both of them are great coaches. Like, sometimes you get, like, shit coach and good coach. You know, like, you get, like, a coach that seems like they don't really care and you get a coach that seems really into, like, coaching and will probably open his own gym one day. Mm -hmm. And I think with both of those guys, they're both, like, good coaches yeah. so that's gonna be a really fun season and there's no beef so it's not gonna be like super awkward like i feel like with uh the my show it was uh gilbert melendez and anthony pettis yeah i felt like it was like that where yeah they didn't want to be in the same room together right but there was no like uh forced beef you know like yeah it was, like chill like they're like oh Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. They're both exactly. yeah, they're they're good dudes. They just yeah, yeah. they're gonna they're 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 both right. they're both ready to throw down at any you know, yeah, you can't put two Latin dudes in a room and tell them to be friends when they're gonna fight, you know, like Yeah, 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 yeah. So that so it's definitely gonna be um fun seeing um Ortega and Volkanovsky just like go through the motions and do their whole coaching thing and Volkanovsky can get over his COVID and <laughs> Right. Well and the funny thing, the good thing is um and I say the good thing, supposedly it's gonna be um middleweights and bantamweights. Because you you have to do dudes with those guys. Because could you imagine a girl season with Ortega as a coach and be like, big me like girls coming in and like the <laughs> tightest little booty short and they're like, coach, coach, pick me. Oh, I think I need some one on one time. The ladies yes. love Brian Ortega so much, and he's such a sweet guy. But I just think that would have been really hilarious actually to see them uh, coaching girls. Well, I don't know. He just shaved his head, so they might be a little less. There it's growing back. He's still got the pretty eyes, Angie. He still has the pretty eyes. Yeah, you're you're right. You're right. Um, so yeah, I I feel like that would that would make things a little awkward for his opponent. It would. Yeah, I hope we I hope we do tough talk. I love doing tough talk back in the day. Um, you know, but I do like that that uh, that they're coaching. I think that's exciting. Oh, here's a here's a a fight I'm curious about, and then you can dig through some more questions. Uh, what do you think about Wonder Boy and Herbert Burns? I mean, uh, and Gilbert Burns, not Herbert Gilbert. Uh, at oh. UC 264, those two are supposed to fight. 
those are like polar opposites. That's what I'm saying. I was like, them. it's this total striker That's versus grappler. Like I'm already can write like the pre-show stuff. You know, I'm already like thinking as soon as I saw that. Yeah. And if I'm honest, like I love Gilbert. He's incredible. But to me, all of a sudden, like. And as soon as I heard about this matchup, I imagined Wonder Boy being seven feet tall. And all of a yeah. sudden, Gilbert got real short to me. And I know that's unfair and not right. But like yeah. suddenly that came to mind was Wonder Boy's length and reach versus how hard um, Gilbert might have to work or how. But he is so fast and explosive. You yeah. know what I mean? That he could cut in there. But literally, that was the first thing that came to my mind was was the physical attributes of the two of them. And then, yeah, the total stylistic opposition. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. I think the only reason we're thinking of uh, Wonder Boy being huge is because of how Usman was able to deal with uh, mm -hmm. Gilbert's pressure. You know, like he was a sniper in there. He was like hitting his like jabs, like super long jabs, right. and then switching and throwing power jabs and just keeping Gilbert away to the point where he got so frustrated he would rush in and get hit again. Mm -hmm. And who is the best, most frustrating <laughs> person? <laughs> The fight after that is Wonder Boy. So right. if anything, that'll be a crash course for Gilbert in dealing with somebody who has like slightly different style. He can't do the same game plan that he's done where it's just like pressure, overwhelming, user, right. using your athleticism to like overwhelm your opponent. You have to be a little more tricky with someone like Wonder Boy. So this is going to be a really good test for him to see if he can like change things up and be a little more tactical because I feel like no one has ever ran Wonder Boy over. No. You know, like that's never happened. He's I don't think always, he can. He, it's a chess match when you when you fight him. So he's, he has to be technical. He has to be savvy. He has to work around Wonder Boy's strengths. And uh, that's going to be interesting. I, I wonder if uh, Gilbert's going to be able to do that. You wonder, boy, if it'll fight. Well, here's the thing, though. The, the other question is, though, is whoa, 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 whoa. we don't see, we don't see uh uh steven on his back much we haven't seen him on the canvas a lot you know i mean he did get wrestled a little bit with tyron uh and we know kind of you know right but that to me is what's going to be really interesting is is uh steven's takedown defense and how much he, you know he spends a lot of time training with with chris weidman and stuff so yeah. uh because weidman moved down to north carolina now anthony uh, smith has been out there with them as well so he's going to get some, nice. another great grappler in there to yeah. work with so I, uh, it's a challenging fight for Dorino, I think. Yeah, it but is. It, but it if, is. but if he gets Steven fun. down, then it's a very challenging fight for Wonder Boy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But um, Wonder Boy, he, he knows how to survive. Yeah. You know, he knows how to survive and he knows how to get back up. And he has like big ass, like hips, like. <laughs> yeah. And he can move them, you know? Yeah. Like, if anything, like, his hips, his karate hips translate to his yeah, yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah. hips. He's able to, like, if you shoot on him, he's able to uh, flip him over and start working his way up before it even, like, hits the ground. So, yeah. um, I don't, I'm, I'm not scared. I'm not super scared for Wonder Boy if it goes to the ground. I, I think it's going to be more of a striking match. I think oh. they're going to be... I think it's going to be a chess match on the feet, and I think Gilbert's going to have to find a way to get into his range to corner him so he can't, like, uh, run run uh, away from the cage and yeah. just find a way to land those power shots because he definitely is going to be at a disadvantage with reach, and, yeah, it's going to be a tough one. Tough well, one sure. yeah, and the, he had, you know, Gilbert had a, I worked the, it was the last show in March in Brasilia last year. Gilbert knocked out, you know, uh, uh, Damian Maya. Mm. Damien, obviously long and lanky, um, like Steven, but a very different kind of fighter, oh, you yeah. know, obviously, so that was different. But speaking of Damien, they just announced that Damien is going to fight Bilal Muhammad, which yeah. I actually really love. You know, I'm, I'm friends with Damien and his manager, Eduardo, and they know that for, uh, you know, for Damien's last fight, there were some things that were offered or whatever, but like they didn't want... They they didn't want the 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 twenty year old young gun right, but at the same time you you need you need somebody like 
legacy appropriate and a, and a and a true challenge, but maybe you don't want the 20 year old, you know what I mean? For, for, for Damien. I mean, let's be honest, yeah. let's be respectable here. So I actually love that Bilal is the matchup here because he is a guy that's going to be full of pressure. He's young, he's hungry, but he's not the 22 year old, like firecracker knockout artist or something like yeah. that. Like, I think it's going to still be an incredibly challenging fight for both of them. It's a huge step up still, you know, obviously we know what happened with Bilal and, and, and Leon in mm -hmm. the main event, and we didn't really get to see him have a real fight. So I'm excited to see Bilal back in a position of a great matchup and with a high marquee value. And to me, I, I really like it for, for Damien as the, the potential last fight here. I think it's an appropriate opponent. I, I'm, I'm cool with that one. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting because, like, uh, Bilal, he likes to just, like, pressure, you know, he likes to pressure with the strikes and then take him down. But with, in this fight, like, don't take down Maya, you know? Like, don't do that. Oh, do take him down. Do take down Damien. I want to see what happens. Do not take down Maya unless you want to get subbed, you know? Like, that's exactly what he wants. If anything, he watched all of his takedowns from the last three fights. Yeah. And he's like, okay, this is how I can set up a submission when he takes me down. Right. So, like, Maya is just, like, elite level submission artist in the UFC. Like, so fucking good. I wish I could just steal his skills, like, like uh, what's uh, what's one of those uh Marvel characters that just suck the the oh, or you can just <laughs> yeah, 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 or you could just go full on Mystique and just be Damien, but like you know what I mean? There you go, yeah. just like transform into him. Uh, it'll be <laughs> Damien Maya. And Bruh. yeah <laughs> he's incredible like, like, he's incredible like and he's <laughs> such a wonderful guy and the, like the classiest guy both of them like that's also what i think what i love about it too is that if it's damien's you know sunset fight uh he got a really honorable opponent who will value the moment and the experience and the challenge and everything about it like it just made yeah. me happy i like that a lot yeah i like the matchup too fuck shit talkers get out of here all right, Please you got a question? You, Karen. No. <laughs> 40, yeah, I know, right? We got 40, it's four, we're at the 45 minute mark. You got a question? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Do you have a question? Because I feel like I. I okay, well, I, no, I'm seeing, I, I, I'm looking on Twitter and stuff to see. I think you got more on your post. Oh, let me look over on your IG. Okay. Um, I think you got more questions over there. Okay. One says, You're so freaking dope. I just wanted to share. Yeah, that. well, I mean, Thank that's you. facts. <laughs> Spitting facts over there. Uh, oh, somebody is asking here. Gra um, Gravity Jordan is asking the Diaz versus Edwards. See, Ooh. I love that my boy Nate is back in action because Me too. I'm a big old Diaz fan. Um, yeah. I've known them since 2005. I don't know, oh, five, wow. six, seven, like way back. I mean, that's way the thing back. is when we started way doing, back. when I started doing the Strike Force, and that's what I'm saying, all those, that coverage back in 2007. Those were a lot of the, those were the uh, Elite XC and I was doing Strike Force and all this. So I, you know, when you're talking about Gil Melendez, like he's one of my oldest buddies in, in doing this. And so like when they did um, uh, 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 the, the grappling thing, I was just talking to Anthony about this the other day. Oh, yeah. when they had it, the, what was it like Elite X? Oh, right. No, 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 no. It was Something. Quintet when they had the Strike Force team, yeah, the, the UFC Quintet team. Thing, right. Right. So I was like, I even tweeted, I was like, love you guys, but my money's like all on the Strike Force guys because those are my homies, right? Because Gil yeah. and even I, we've gotten to work together at the desk sometimes at ESPN and like he would come and we're like my oh, man and like yeah. we're like look at us now you know what I mean and so it, it feels really good and I haven't seen Nick in a long time I talked to him sometime I saw Nate recently like so that's the thing is we uh, I love them and I will mm -hmm. always support them like I you know I think they're great and they over the years have just been great with me and we we've all been cool with each other and I just love it um that's a tough fight, though, for Nate, because Leon's really freaking good, and he was starting to really look like a real winner there. I mean, we know the fight with Bilal was too short, but he was starting yeah. to really heat up, and it was starting to look like, oh, this guy's, like, number three for a reason, and, like, he's really, really good. For sure. But I'm happy for Leon because he's getting a high-profile fight, yes. even though it's not the title shot. And I know he was like, I need the title shot, and everyone was like, you deserve the title shot. And then they're like, we're not giving you the title shot. And it's like, oh. 
But you get yeah. Nadia's, everyone's going to fucking watch that shit. Like, nobody's not going to watch that shit. And I love Nate. Like, he is amazing. He yeah. is so funny. He's so cool. Like, like I love his quote. Like, Conor McGregor, you're taking everything from me, motherfucker, that I built. Like, yeah. he, he legit, like, is the bad boy of MMA. Totally. You know? Like, him choking a guy out in a triangle with, like, two middle fingers Look in the air. Off. Like, that's. That's so cool. Like, I wish I had, like, an epic moment like that in MMA. Like, right. he's, he's just amazing. And um, I always felt, uh, you know, like, I, like I, I, a connection with them, too, because they would come on the show. Well, not uh, not Nick, but Nate would come on the show and give us his little secrets. And he would always, like, whenever he w wanted to tell us, like, one of his secret moves, He'd like make one of the girls stand in front of the camera. Right, right. Go, okay, uh, hey, stand over there. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. good. All right. So this is what I do when I'm in the guard. You know, yes. it's so funny. He's so like shady and and uh and fun and just like cool to be around. Yep. So I'm I'm really excited for him getting back in there. It's gonna be a high profile fight, it's gonna be a fun fight. And like he's at that point where he just shows up to like put on a show you know yeah. he's showing up for a performance like mm -hmm. win or lose it's always going to be fun you're never going to be mad that you sat down to watch him and uh yeah i'm excited for it yeah he is one of those guys i would say that about both of the, the diaz brothers is that some people like you know they're detractors uh look at his record look at them. i'm like yeah but look at all the people that they fought and whatever whatever yeah. like i'm not exactly. even worried about a diaz record because yeah I yeah. just love them, and I'm always going to be down, so. It's dope as shit. Whatever. Yeah. When, when you're dope, doesn't matter how many losses you have. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, yeah, love, yeah. love, 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 love. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, so I saw that. Yeah, I'm looking up the questions here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to get a da, question. Da, 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 da. Oh, are we late? Are we well, if we've got 10 minutes left. It's four, We're at the 50-minute mark. Okay. Um, um, I see a few good ones. But... Oh, so people are talking about the UFC PI in Africa. Um, it's saying that yeah. uh, there's none of them have trained in Africa though, so it's in complete talent mind to be tapped. This is from Frederick Stark eighty nine, and I agree with you. Um, my friend Richie Walsh and uh, Dean Amasinger they work at the the PI over in Shanghai, and actually awesome. um, Richie and I were talking the other day because Richie fought my boy Alan Joban, and then we ended up becoming friends, and I've seen Richie like when I was over in uh, Shenzhen last year, and he's just a mm. great guy, and he cool. works at the PI there, and so does Dean. And so they actually recently had put out a thing about a job posting for people who are training. They needed some coaches over there. I was like, yeah, coach, like what an ideal opportunity. But yes, <laughs> I think for, for, for Africa it would be incredible because obviously we have Francis, we have Israel, we have uh, Kamaru. They're yeah. all African born. And mm -hmm. yes, they had to go other places to train because the resources weren't there. If we've seen, you've seen Francis, you've seen Kamar, all three of them have gone back to their hometowns and done mm -hmm. things and um, trying to build some infrastructure and educate. And, and I, I love all of it. So yeah, I hope we get a UFC Africa one day. There's an EFC Africa, which is a group, uh, you know, an yeah. MMA organization over there. Yeah. yeah. So we've had some fighters come over from that organization into the UFC. Um, but right now you've got like Drikas Duplessis. I can't say his name very well, but Drikas is from uh, South uh, Africa. Africa. We just had the okay. buys, uh, right? JB uh, Bay, uh, Bays, rather. Han Remember the two that fought the husband and wife that fought on the card the same day. Hannah oh, Bays. I mean, they're they're South. African. Yeah, he's South African. She's not. Oh. She's American, right? But she's he's oh, okay. South African. So <laughs> also we have Moroccan fighters uh, on the card. You know, so when when we talk about Africa, a lot of people just think of like black people, you know. But um, there's a lot more there, and so there actually would be a lot of talent um to fill out a UFC Africa card. I think it would be awesome. That just makes me think of uh, Mean Girls. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Mean Girls with their tribe. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. But yeah, you got yeah, like yeah. Sadiq Youssef. You have a lot of like yeah. African-born guys, but like the uh, Zaytar brothers are from Morocco. There's there's a lot of other people from um from the African uh, uh, continent. So if, from my perspective, I'm just stoked at the opportunity to fly out to any country in Africa and be like, hey, I'm in the UFC and there's a fight this weekend. Right. And just be like, hey, you know, party with my fucking African right. brothers and sisters. Like, I would love that so much. Like, I'm, I'm so into the idea of UFC Africa. I'm so into the idea of uh, of a PI out there. I think that would be amazing. Like, I feel like 
I feel like a lot of like black Americans have always dreamed of making that trip back yeah. to the motherland, wherever it is, you know, like I've, I've personally, I've always wanted to go to Ghana uh-huh. um, and just like, just, just see it, you know, just see where my ancestors came from. And I think that's like, uh, is a great excuse mm-hmm. to go, you know, the fact wow. that there's a UFC out there, like, um, my, uh, my teammate, Wilson Hayes, he was going to fight before like the pandemic happened. He was scheduled to fight, um, last year, summer on, on EFC. Yeah. So I was really excited about that because I'm like, hey, I'm going to come out there, oh, corner, yeah. come out there, watch you fight, like root for you and just fucking party wherever the fuck it is. I think it was going to be, where was it going to be? I think it was going to be in South Africa. Yeah, EFC I think was usually in South Africa or like Ruan yeah, Potts yeah. is a heavyweight. He, he was in EFC and came to the UFC. Yeah, I think it's usually yeah. South Africa. Yeah, so so unfortunately that event got canceled because of the pandemic and everything, but that would be so cool. I'm I'm really I'm really into that idea. I think a lot of people would be into that idea and like the talent pool is deep Ridiculous. out there. There's, there's nothing else to do. There's but nothing great for things, you know? Like that's what Yeah, the like, talent would be it is sports because there's nothing else to do. Like, yeah. you know, like you're not um you you can go to uh any any given place and find like a phenom at something. Right. I watched a documentary about a guy building a Tesla out there, you know, like in 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 like uh Nigeria or something. Yeah. I'm just like Holy shit, like you know, there there's a lot of like just untapped talent. Oh, I think it would be incredible. Yeah, I think I, it would be I, incredible. Amazing to just go yeah, out there, yeah. build the eye let the talent roll in and then like mold them into uh, amazing fighters. It'll be great. And it it will actually be interesting to see the trickle down effect that we have with these three champions now and how much positivity can come from that. But I do think I was like, okay, if we get the UFC Africa, I was like, I'll probably get that assignment. Because I'm pretty sure they won't send Brendan to work the desk on that one. So I might, yeah, you never know, but I might get that assignment. (laughs) I love Brendan. I'm not, I'm not, it's just that I would hope to get that assignment and UFC Kingston or UFC Jamaica, which, uh, we also need to make happen at some point. But, um, yeah, that'd be Hey, amazing. listen, Ange, we need to wrap it up because we're going to run out of, we're going to run out of time. But so uh, for people who need to know what, so it's what I haven't want. So, um, you uh, now, <laughs> since you are officially sort of back in camp, everybody needs to be following you. So where can they find you for on your social media? Follow me on Instagram and Twitter so you see what I'm doing in my camps. And also um TikTok, I my uh account is Overkill Hill. So okay. follow me at Angie Overkill on Instagram and Twitter or TikTok at Overkill Hill. Cool. And I'm KB Heat on Instagram. Karen Bryant everywhere else, K-A-R-Y-N, B-R-Y-A-N-T. And so you can hit subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. We obviously also put this out on Angie's IGTV. It's on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts as well. Uh, so, yeah. So thanks. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the questions. And we got more face punching next week. So. Mm. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Back on it. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. Can't wait to watch the fight. See you, peeps. <laughs>